Snyder, welcome to Apollo's Water. Thank you. This is a fire hose already. Oh, and I've toned it back. I've really toned it back <laughs> really? just for you. Okay. Just, you know you're coach. You don't need to hold back. I can handle it. Oh, I don't know. I was the can. dramatic roller coaster girl growing up, so you can I can I can, <laughs> I, can I can go for it. Okay. All right. Well, let's let's see what we have here. Are you ready for the fast five? I think so. Well, actually, I don't think so, but we'll see what comes out. All right. You are in DC now, mm -hmm. but you spent a long time in Houston, Texas. So yes. DC or Houston? Houston, hands down. Why? Um, okay, not the prettiest city in the world. Admittedly, it's like an urban jungle that just the freeways never end. And sometimes there's 16 lanes, but the people, the food, the spirit of future orientation and chutzpah to collaborate with whomever, the embrace of difference, not the fear of it, and um, surprisingly beautiful artistic sensibilities once you get past the concrete and inside people's homes, inside museums, inside pop-ups, all sorts of things. I just felt like it was the new Ellis Island of our day when I was there. Um, and yeah, I feel very homesick for a place that I wasn't even born in, but it's just uh, gives me hope for America, that city. <laughs> How many years were you in Houston? You know, I was only there for three years, but it captured me. It was had a bit of a vulnerable transition time of my life. And um, I had been in D.C. before and back now. Um, but uh, but there's just something about the lack of pretentiousness that and even though it was such an unwieldy, sprawling place physically, um, I just found layers and layers of people who embraced me like family there when I needed it. Mm. So I'll never I'll never forget it. Never forget that city. That's pretty awesome. That's yeah. Pretty awesome. So how about this then? This doesn't have to be in Houston. This can be anywhere. But my okay. favorite date restaurant, you're going on a date. Ooh. Your favorite Ooh. date restaurant is what? Gosh, well, I don't know why I'm going to say this because my husband has not taken me here, but this is what first came to mind. The um, like a teppanyaki place where they cook in front of you. <laughs> I don't know why that first came to mind, but it's like, well, let me go back to my dating days, like free covenantal permanent relationship. If you feel like there's going to be awkwardness, it's nice to have a bit of a show in front of you that you can interact with and like talk about a lot of other things that are inspired by someone lighting their hands on fire or throwing an egg in the air. So I need to tell my husband to take me there. I think we're past the awkward stage, I hope, but. <laughs> okay, wait a minute. Um, what did you, what did you call it though? I, I well, am I, to... am I not calling it right? Like it's sort of a Japanese te teppanyaki? Where they, teppanyaki? Where like... I've never heard that word before. Teppanyaki. That's right. I mean, if you I'm can wrong... be right. You're the, you're the editor in chief. Um, should, we, I, should we Google I, this? Oh no. I I don't know. Please, no, I, the internet is our friend in these ways. I grew up in Hong Kong, but actually have still never been to Japan. Um, I'm hoping to change that. Yeah, it's um, teppanyaki, T-E-P-P-A-N-Y-A-K-I. I have um, learned something. Often confused with hibachi. It's a post-World War II style of Japanese oh, cuisine. Oh, so hibachi There you go. Dead. Well, hibachi. maybe it's, let's just say it's either or, and we'll get the facts right afterwards. Hibachi <laughs> or teppanyaki. <laughs> Teppanyaki. It's the title okay. for the podcast. <laughs> Teppanyaki. Yeah, that'll get a lot of hits. <laughs> okay. Um, here's the third one. My most annoying habit to those closest to me is what? Oh, falling asleep as soon as I'm like horizontal. I used to be like a bookworm till late or like I just, I, as I get older, I, as soon as it's like, especially in winter and it goes dark uh. earlier, I just like, I've, I fall asleep really easily. And for anyone, whether I'm traveling and I'm with a girlfriend and she happens to be staying like, you know, or husband or whatever, there's just like, how do you, how are you asleep already? I thought we were going to have a great conversation. So yeah. You don't fall asleep in podcasts though, do you? Uh, hopefully not. It depends. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's keep, let's keep going. <laughs> I, I have a problem of falling asleep anywhere. I, I can do you? Fall asleep so anywhere. you're I, like, I am. Yeah. I have fallen asleep in the middle of music rehearsals of a choir. I was in, I, I played, I played basketball as a, as a teenager. I mean, you're talking like 40 years ago, 30 years ago now, but I could fall asleep in basketball practice in a drill. It was the craziest thing in the world. I still, to this day, if we're driving with my family, I have to, if I eat, I have to pull over for 15 minutes and I'm great. 
but but it annoys my family it annoys so but you wouldn't be like on your way to a layup and then just collapse it wasn't like that okay okay not not narcolepsy yeah Yeah, not narcolepsy not narcolepsy (laughs) just falling asleep oh when i was in speaking of teenagerhood um i sang in a high school choir and there was a very memorable episode i don't think it was narcolepsy or even so much sleep but we were singing we were performing in a super hot uh, like auditorium was just like so stagnant. None of it was hard to breathe. And there was a very prominent tenor, super tall. He was like six foot three or four. And so it kind of like stood out in the men's section. And um, he had something, the heat hit him and he fainted in the midst of like, I don't know, we were doing Carmina Burana or something really dramatic. <laughs> and then he like just collapses and falls. And it was like the whole tenor section of domino effect. They all just went down. In the performance? And, um, During the in performance? In the performance. Yeah, it was, oh. I'll never forget. I think I was a sophomore or junior. And um, yeah, that's probably not sleep, you know, pose. I do. I remember we had to bring out, you know splash of water and all that to revive him but um yeah it was was kind of a funny scene if tiktok had existed it would have been like the perfect gif (laughs) gif whatever the however you're supposed to pronounce that (laughs) yeah i still don't know every time i get it i don't don't either i I have no idea i know we're we're old we fall asleep anywhere and we don't know how to pronounce digital acronyms (laughs) okay now you're making me feel old all right (laughs) let's go let's go to number four because you are an editor-in-chief what is the best journalistic advice you've ever received? Well, this is the best advice I ever received. Uh, although it goes like I was just rereading famous Orwell's has like five rules of writing that are really uh, great. Like don't use a big word when a small one will do. Don't use mixed mm. metaphors. And I was just reviewing them yesterday, refreshing. And I was like, oh, so much pain ahead of me. Even I still have to, I definitely still break these rules. But the best piece of advice that was ever given to me was um, your verbs need to grow up. So I don't know if that's always true in like hard news reporting, but in the kind of writing we publish at comment and what I try to do is try to avoid the verb or derivatives of the verb to be. So like is, are, like there's always, there can always be a more interesting, precise verb. So have fun with that. So I, mm. that's, I'm sort of attracted to people who take adventures with words, which um, my fellow editors may not always like, but I think it's having, you know, painting with prose is, um, you know, you want to make things zippy for the reader. Oh. So, hmm. but I'm not sure like a normal newspaper, like an actual hard news story type of reporter would agree with me at all. <laughs> they, it's mm. you're supposed to be very direct. Um, you know, in fact, in my own marriage, cause I'm married to a journalist, he'll often say like, there's two of us in this marriage. One of us is a pointer one of us is a painter and it's very obvious who the painter is and it's not him. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So I think, what, you know, maybe I'll take back. If there's, I'm trying to think if there's another great journalistic piece of advice. Uh, yeah. Don't, I guess, um, I mean, what you would say to most early reporters is just never say no, like say yes to every experience and interview you can get uh, because mm the sort of the more prismatic exposure you have, the better story you'll be able to write. But. That's awesome. I actually, I like that one. The verb one freaks me out because it's in my yeah, head. Yeah, okay. Now I'm like, I got to say all these words. Now I'm going to be I'm judging you. Oh, don't like worry. <laughs> I barely no. speak English. I can't hardly. even remember the, the Japanese word you gave. That, what, was no, it? Hardly. I, well, that was a Google. That was a Google reward. So oh, we don't have to Google. count that. Okay. Gosh, maybe made me feel dumb, man. Thanks. I'm sorry. Thanks I, know. A lot. I don't know how to make friends and influence people. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, that's okay. I often feel that way. I feel that <laughs> way all the time. You know, as I get older, though, it's even that way with my kids. Like, I'll say stuff and my kids. It's like, you know, I grew up watching Sesame Street, and there was always this, this little bit in the middle of the show where you would have this, like, Sam Eagle, like, turning his head like this. And my kids are doing that to me now. They're like, Dad, just stop. Just stop, Dad. Don't do TikTok. Just please don't say that word, Dad. You sound so just stupid. Just be your dad. age, Dad. Just be, just be your age. age. Like, just be Embrace yourself. It. I'm like, I am. That's why I'm saying it right now. And you're like, like, I'm a lifelong learner. Stop. Let me adjust to your <laughs> coolness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, your coolness. And they're like, yeah, no. No, Dad, <laughs> please stop. It's like, hey, I'm going to do it anyway. I love making my kids awkward. It's the best part of being a dad. Okay. Number five. If you were a design style, what design style would you be and why? Ooh. Oh no, I don't know. 
I don't even know if I know a name of a design style. Are we talking like architecture, clothing, interior? I don't know. What, Whatever what we... you want it to be. <laughs> oh, man. That makes it worse, doesn't it? How about interior? Well, How about that? I get, I don't know. Well, let me just, I do have a, th like a lot of us. Um, well, I don't know, like a lot of us. I enjoy, I've, I'm particular about my email font. Well, that is that a way of answering it? So I really like <laughs> email you know, font. You, like you find a font that feels like it represents somehow your je ne sais quoi, your your fragrance, your, your like style, your personality. Exactly. Yeah. So I've come to like a font called Palatino. Oh. Um, so like that's the way I know how to answer it. That's like the classic writerly response. <laughs> Very lame. Um, <laughs> Not design style. I'm going to think in terms of fonts. I mean, so, I will say I do because I grew up overseas. My, I think there is a. I love strong primary colors like reds and blues, and like none of. I, well, I happen to be wearing pastels today, but in general, I don't like like the pastel thing. Not so much. I, you know, just like let's be bold, let's celebrate the mm. world, and so yeah, that's like I go more towards like dramatic. I love that though. Colors. I love that. I you mentioned you grew up overseas. So I, I want to yeah. explore a little bit of your biography because you mentioned okay. Hong Kong, you've been in Houston, you went to Wheaton. I know, I know you went, according to your public uh, persona, you've gone to Georgetown too. Mm -hmm. um, and now you're in DC, but give us a little bit of your, your bio. Sure. Yeah. So I was um, just geographically, I'm a bit of a mutt. I um, love meeting people who have very strong roots in one place and go back generations in one zip code. And I'm always a little envious, but we, you know, there's pros and cons to, to both. So I born in Boston uh, when I was four, my family moved to Hong Kong. Um, when I was eight, moved to Sydney, Australia. We had quite a, a lot of opportunities in that time to travel around mostly South, uh, East Asia. Um, and then, and then came back to the Boston area. So it wasn't, wasn't forever. It was, you know, just a little over six years, but it was enough of that kind of magic formation time where it didn't really know any different that it was a little unusual to feel like one of the only Americans in a context and all that. So I think it did just give me um, a forever bug to kind of be on the edge of the inside of different kinds of more homogenous communities and, and be fascinated by cultural comparisons and, um, mm -hmm. So yeah, back in the New England area, I heard, you know, you talk about going to Gordon Conwell. I, yeah. before we moved overseas, actually, I, I pseudo learned how to walk, um, according to parental lore on Crane's Beach. <laughs> Did you ever go there? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, and there was like a great apple farm nearby. I can't remember what it was called in, in uh, Ipswich or, yeah. but I just remember like apple donuts and stuff. So we would, when we moved back to the, um, uh, Boston area, we wound up in a town called Andover on the North Shore. Yeah. So I, um, on yeah, the North Shore, on the on North Shore. On the, yeah, I can't quite yeah. do the accent. You gotta, and you I, do, see, I was in Peabody. I mean, I can pack the car. That's the only thing that's yeah. like too cliche. But beyond that, I really can't do the accent. It's funny. My, neither of my parents are from the area, so they didn't have the accent. <sighs> and, and then I went to a high school. I was a day student, but I went to this high school that attracted boarding students from all over the world. Um, and so it just, there wasn't like a huge New England, I mean, it was New England. There was, it was New England institutionally. It wasn't so New England, like culturally. Um, so uh, that was that very um, pretty, you know, wonderful high school in many ways, very rigorous, a uh, unique experience, I think to be that age and back in a bit of an international environment, very secular. I had a, sort of conversion experience as a sophomore in the context of a church youth group, uh, Grace Chapel, if that church means anything to you. And, um, and then read this book called the scandal of the evangelical mind when I was a junior or senior and, uh, found it very intriguing and thought, okay, all my peers here are going to largely new England colleges, maybe like pretty elite schools. I'm going to go to my college counselor and see if she's ever heard of a place called Wheaton College in Illinois, if that's where this guy Mark Knoll used to be. I'm just interested in this whole idea of integrating faith and learning. And I remember the college counseling office was like, what is this? Why would you leave a place like Andover and go to a place like Wheaton? That seems like a big step backwards in all the sort of meritocratic norms that they had as like what, what mattered in terms of prestige and name brand yeah. and recognition. And, and just the fact that it had, you know, this is before the word evangelical became a four letter word, but it mm -hmm. still was affiliated with kind of a subculture that a, a sort of new England 
brain thought was like anathema to everything good and enlightened and sophisticated. So is it, uh, so anyways, I, but I wind up, I did wind up choosing to go to Wheaton. And um, so that was its own huge culture shock and great formation. Um, I can keep going. Should I, you want me to just yeah, keep going? Go? Yeah. This okay. is awesome. By the way, I gotta um, stop you though. Mark yeah. is coming on next week. Oh no way. That is yeah. so crazy. We, you know, it's so funny. Um, I have, he's, he has, he's a piece for common actually that's in my pile to edit. Um, and we, it's, I have not actually seen him in person since I graduated almost 20 years ago. He had left for Notre Dame. He was there yeah. when I went. And then by the time he, he left for Notre Dame, but um, it was just so cool. When I graduated Wheaton and I was asked to give this like little talk around the baccalaureate or something. And he was at, he was invited back to give the commencement address. And I, it was just, I keep feeling, I mean, he's had in a way we hardly know each other, but he's had such a, he did have impact. such a impact just in that, you know, those like people who wind up paving these Sort of oh, yeah. enunciation moments for your what become you know consequential choices so yeah Wheaton in perfect place but for me and given my kind of where I'd come from very grateful for that education in that time I wound up as a philosophy major I was like the only person who didn't have dreadlocks in that major but I loved it <laughs> um pretty male dominated I would say um I kind of liked that too actually it was fun like I don't know you just like um but I, I well I don't mean that in an overly I mean maybe there was some flirting going on but it was probably more just like in the Wheaton context these Christian colleges can be very why are you laughing <laughs> no because I went to Christian colleges I know exactly what you're talking yeah, about yeah so like this is kind so, of way you flirt you know it's just yeah. the way it goes it's just the way, and I think sometimes I felt like it was this shock to me coming from a pretty academically aggressive, no holds barred intellectual environment in high school to go to a context like Wheaton, which under the water, I joke like Wheaties are kind of like swans, like acting very chill and smooth and like gliding across the water above, but underneath they're like going furiously, but they're not going to show off about that. It's because yeah, you need yeah. to sort of be a little bit publicly pious or it's like, we care about who you are, not what you do, like <laughs> all those things, which are, I would say good values, but yeah. as it pertained to gender, and this is going back 20 years, but um, there were certain, I think there was some hangover from an earlier era where it sort of seemed like if you were a female student, you were either going to teach kindergarten and get married by 20, age 22, 23, and nothing wrong at all with either of those things, but the sort of like impulse to express an original thought and challenge mm. a professor and duke it out, all of those kinds of modes of engaging with ideas uh, tended to be more of like a male thing in a, mm. in a, in that sort of Christian college context. So I was attracted to the philosophy major because it kind of felt like a place full of permission to just go for yeah. it in those ways. Yeah. I wasn't great at it. I, I remember getting quite a few C's and B's. Um, it was hard, um, but I loved it. And um, that combined with, um, had a very impressionable experience digging ditches in Honduras, which is just one of those like moments of realizing maybe I have, I'm called to be some form of a bridge builder. There was something mm -hmm. in that experience combined with, I think, you know, you talk about your um, church and Aurora mm -hmm. and how you were kind of between these like radically different worlds and, and also just radically different days, like what people's concerns were the um, just so different in the nature of, frankly, the level of suffering, um, the communitarian versus individualistic, how we treat time. And I felt like that just in this brief experience in Honduras, uh, seeing like levels of of sort of poverty and chaos on the one hand paired with extraordinary communitarian um, cohesion over and above sort of an, a set of American colleagues who were um, not at all sure how to handle, and myself somewhat included, you know, how to handle the level of like impoverishment and gender relations and all that. Um, Anyways, I, there, there's a lot of dynamics I could describe, but there was something in this very particular experience that was embodied that was where I found myself in this position of kind of translating culturally and linguistically. And I view it as sort of like the beginning of, I don't know what this will look like in my life, but somehow maybe I have, I've been given some tools um, and life experiences to um, exist on the borders between communities and help them understand one another, whether that's generational or social class or cultural or whatever. Um, and that continues to be, I think, just like an inner 
um, drumbeat in me that I'm grateful kind of happened when I was in college at 19 Mm. in a way that was like outside of the cerebral seminar of Kierkegaard. I mean, you know, there there were relationships between what I was studying, but it was like, I really did not think I would end up in the intellectual sphere. When I left Wheaton, I was convinced I was going to like be very grassroots, like work in real communities, get my hands dirty, sleeves up. I didn't quite know what that would look like, but, and somewhat to my surprise, the only jobs that I could get immediately following were in this like weird world called the think tank world. (laughs) So that's what I wound up in. Um, And that was a journey of kind of, I, I was put with, um, in, in a program, a foreign policy program is like a research assistant. And we worked with a lot of journalists and pretty sophisticated journalists. So that was kind of my exposure. The theory of change was like, if you can influence the media, hold events for them and educate them on in that at the time we were, it was like a program related to Iran and Venezuela. And it was kind of random in retrospect. And there was, yeah, I was very naive politically as this own story. So I come to DC a bit like this is the job that hired me. Um, I like the idea. I had also sort of been international relations major in college. I like the idea mm. of doing something global related. Maybe this could be a path to being in the foreign service. Like, you know, you're just like open to whatever that rings at all of anything you've touched in your life. Um, and um, to my surprise, I wind up like hanging out with all these journalists all the time through this think tank program. And I just was so attracted to the ways in which they could be 70 years old and they were still so curious. They just had this lifelong learning zest about them that they weren't bored basically. And they, they, there was, there was just something about the earnestness with which they wanted to uncover reality. And of course, there's so much I could say about media now that I've been more in and out of it. And, you know, so many dynamics have shifted over the last 20 years, particularly as media has become more I think politicized on all sides. Um, but at the time, all I saw was people who really wanted to render an honest story. Um, so that appealed to me and I kind of migrated into the world of magazines and the newspapers in DC um, and was still interested in bringing like a higher conceptual philosophical set of categories, but didn't wasn't so interested in just having that rest at like systematic, broad-based, top-down levels. I wanted to be in real lives at gritty crossroads. So I got very interested in kind of what's happening as second, third, fourth generation immigrants in the US. How are they negotiating their identity? What are their trusted information channels? All of that. And so I was somehow had a few journalistic opportunities, basically freelance people who found out of my background and they were like, it seems like you could give us some insight into some of these different ethnic communities and different at different generational levels in terms of how long they've been in the U.S. You know, could you write about why certain people are voting a certain way or where people are trusting where information comes from? How are people finding out about job opportunities who are outside of the main dominant culture? So that was like all just felt like heaven to me because I um, I think it reminded me of growing the way I grew up and I had sort of a grid for how certain communities like a humble grip, not, you know, it's not like I was a grown up in rural Korea and suddenly knew what it meant to be a 1.5 Korean immigrant, but there was enough um, in my own background. And I think just the yeah. dinner table I grew up in that helped me basically have these just joy filled interviews with people who would open up. And it actually really helped to be a person of faith. Like I was finding I, you know, I was working for pretty secular media outlets at the time, and there were very few journalists who had a transcendent frame of reference. It's a pretty, it's, it's a pretty secular workforce uh, by and large. And I found that just believing in God helped me get into certain kinds of Buddhist temples and mm. who Hindu this. And of course, you know, Vietnamese Jesuit communities and Korean Presbyterian and Nigerian Pentecostal, like there was something about the religious understanding that both helped me ask questions in an interview that was sort of beneath the waves. It's hard to describe. And, um, you know, I was welcomed into a very core civic institution, especially for those who were still first, second generation Americans, or, you know, mm-hmm. they're still in that, yeah. that journey. There was a way in which, and I, I sometimes I'd like to tell more secular journalists this, like not that this is going to compel them towards a faith journey, but um, 
I sometimes want to say, like, I feel like you're not trusted and you don't have access to what's actually going on in a variety of different ethnic communities and our burgeoning demographic unfurling in the U.S. because your frames of reference are all Harvard or are all, you know, the debt ceiling. Like, like there's a way in which if you're not able to sort of do the practices and share religious practice with another who's very different from you culturally, you're not really going to ascertain that much that could ever about a given about a given community and how it operates. So I don't know if that makes sense, but it was kind of this like delicious secret I felt like I discovered. Um, gave me entree surprisingly into all kinds of people groups and their homes and hospitals and bedsides and mentoring. I mean, it was just really fascinating. So mm. that then I was given a chance, kind of I did some writing on some of those dynamics around identity and how do you think about the traditions and the moral traditions you've inherited from your typically more conservative homeland and then this yeah. individualistic materialistic country called America yeah. how do you negotiate how do you handle your kids who are if you, you know if you're the first generation parent and you're watching them become more american this is exactly what you want for them at the same time you're mourning the loss of certain values as you watch them kind of take on a more modern American consciousness. Um, so all of that, and I was at a foundation in Texas, was intrigued by, by, I guess, what I was writing about, how I was writing about it, and um, invited me to come to Houston. And they were like, if you're really interested in these dynamics of America's demography and how it's shifting and which institutions are embracing those shifts and which are struggling, um, come to a city that is just exploding at the seams with so I think at the time it was the most diverse, most languages in the U.S. city in the country, um, which none of my New Yorker friends <laughs> understood. I think they were like, mm -hmm. Houston, that's like all cowboys, right? And I was like, actually, no, it really is the world. Yes, yeah. um, so I said, yes, it was a, and that was a total adventure. And I got to tell all kinds of longer form, usually magazine stories and was paid to do it. Uh, and I had a steady way to put bread on my table by this. Uh, foundation called the H.G. Butt Foundation, uh, which also supports something some of your listeners may be familiar with called Laity Lodge in the Hill Country, hmm. uh, which is sort of an ecumenical retreat center. So there was also like kind of a faith appreciation through that foundation as they were kind of experimenting with nonprofit journalism. And yeah, so none of these things would I have ever imagined when I was 18. Like you don't know about these like weird career paths <laughs> yeah. when you're young. Um and then do you want me to keep going? I'll, I can yeah, speed up no, here. I, 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 first of all, I want to know why, why were you, your, your family in Hong Kong? I mean, go from Hong Kong, Australia, were they, what were they doing? My dad um, worked for a Boston based bank in foreign exchange currency trading. So they were interested in having him start um, a branch of the bank in Hong Kong and then also in Sydney. And my mother, um, had been the daughter of uh, Bible translators slash linguists in Peru. So we kind of had this, that was the other part of the background was our apartments and our homes had a bit of this like Peruvian indigenous flavor from her growing up years in the Amazon, but our sort of external relations and friendships as a family, it, when we were living over there were more kind of, you know, cosmopolitan, diplomatic finance, that sort of tier in Asia. So it was sort of like Latin America indigenous plus you know, Hong Kong global finance. Interesting, you know, I, I don't know what else. It's sort of an interesting way to it's very uh, try to make I sense mean, of the world. It is eclectic. Yeah. Southern Northern Hemisphere. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's fascinating to see just your cultural experiences and how that shaped and formed you. I mean, having Wheaton as a base and then yeah. exploring this new world of Houston. And it is one of the most diverse places in the world. I know, especially in the United States and a lot of I'd say a lot of uh, majority world uh, or majority of Americans yeah. would be unfamiliar with that, no matter what your cultural background is, unless you're they, in, in that, right. that diverse world. So you're in Houston, right. working for a foundation, you're writing, but then what happened? And then um, about three years in, I got a phone call from an organization that I had heard of, but I had always wondered kind of what they did and they've shifted. So I'll just preface to say they've shifted a bit in ways that I don't love now, to be honest, I can say that on air, but they, it's called the philanthropy round table. And basically it's like a gathering or it's a, um, it's an organization that tries to help foundations and individual donors um, give more wisely kind of according to their values. So, um, 
they were, there was a group of donors who were kind of members of this essentially association Mm. um, that were getting very concerned about the fact that it felt like character building institutions were running out of fashion and who was really kind of like, where the, where the Boy Scouts anymore? Like, how come we don't seem to have as many um, institutions, both in our education system, public and private, families, um, sports? Like, it just feels like the moral layer of, of giving people, like, beautiful desires and well-ordered loves and all that, that that's kind of gone by the wayside in a more technocratic nation. Mm-hmm. That or in a nation that's kind of like stopped asking questions of why and what for, and that we become, you know, our metrics of the good life are a little whacked out. Um, so it's a big unwieldy kind of curiosity and concern. And these donors or this sort of initial set of foundations and individuals were asked the round table to develop a program called the character initiative, where some, they would hire someone to go out and figure out how is character being shaped in a very pluralist new 21st century. That was not as arguably kind of culturally homogenous, morally didn't have as much of a shared kind of moral frame of reference as one might argue had occurred a hundred years prior when a lot of like the Boy Scouts and the YMCA and the Settlement House Movement and the Temperance Movement and all those kind of that interesting progressive flowering of um, these like big civic institutions that had local manifestations occurred. And basically they were like, could that happen again today, even though we're such a, we're a much more diverse society. Um, so they, the round table somehow at that point, I think I had published enough things at the intersections of like culture, institutions and institutional health, um, demographic shifts and a little bit of sort of religion and values. It's like kind of a random assortment. They got a hold of me and I had had some contacts in DC. So I, there was a few relationships I had built in DC in my first stint there that and the Flanfy round tables headquartered in DC. So they called and they said, Anne, you know, would you be interested in writing a book, like first doing, spend a year, like traveling the country, first understanding what these donors even mean by character across left and right. Um, But then just go out and go across civil society and go to any institution that claims to be forming people morally and bring kind of your interest in and your sensitivity to cross-cultural dynamics into the question of moral formation. And would you write a book about it for us? And then maybe build, help build a more consequential, like, coalition of donors around whatever principles you discern. So it was kind of this amazing question. Um, I hesitated at first because I, I think there was like, it was like the Wheaton critic. It was like the Wheaton sort of like too clever by half DNA in me or something slash frankly, cause this is, and it's a secular organization and mm-hmm. more conservative, more politically conservative, but not necessarily faith filled that was sort of asking, had interest in this question. And I was like, character, like, I don't know. I don't want to be like the goody goody, like Bill Bennett wrote the book of virtues. Like what, you know, I don't know. I was just sort of like, I don't know. I like, do we want to revo- make, I was like, not that motivated at the time by mm. essentially like creating a boy scouts Renaissance, which is sort of what I thought was being asked. But the more I thought about it, it just was, it felt like a new interesting step to kind of, um, yeah, almost give a little bit more of um, not a sermon to my vocate, but like a, there was a, there was, there was something attractive about be, well, I'll just put it this way because my experience in Houston personally had been one where, like I said, at the outset, I really felt like I was given a series of substitute families in different communities and through certain kinds of institutions that took me in that kind of refashioned me after I had sort of just had a bit of a mess of things occur right before I left to go to you. And I think I was just like, I am very interested now in essentially this, the role of substitute families and, or at least the role of this broader web of institutions that whether you wanted to say it's the church or a voluntary association or a neighborhood outfit or um, an acapella group or uh, this sort of social service collection of volunteers or the arts, like, all of that diversity and sort of these collective forms in a place had not only rescued me, but sort of given me fresh purpose and nudged me and kind of at times disciplined me in ways when just, yeah, it's, that's its own story. But even my place of work, I felt like was this more almost became like a church for me at, at a time when I needed it. So I was interested in this as 
like, it feels like a lot of people aren't finding in the church or in their families or whatever, they're not finding places of healthy belonging. They're not finding safe places to make mistakes and to be held accountable and to be given grace to get up again and try. Um, they're not being given exemplars. Um, friendships are declining. Like all these things I was kind of aware of that I had experienced in my own idiosyncratic way in my biography. Okay, I, I'm like, what? what does it look like to strengthen to name what a healthy institution and community is that can help forge a person's sense of the good and their interior life. And um, yeah, like I was just interested in this question of like individual agency and the conditions of an organization or community that you're a part of. So I said yes to the project. Um, that was its own adventure. It took about three years. I wind up eventually moving back to DC as the, because that's where the offices were tearfully left Houston. I still have maintained a lot of relationships there and will never not evangelize the surprise beauty of that city. Um, and wrote a book called The Fabric of Character, which um, essentially was a series of narratives about the most exemplary organizations I could find, community organizations, schools, um, arts communities, um, interesting experiments in theater, um, and it was, and then I would, I sort of found this uh, rehab communities. I found this sort of pattern of um, underlying principles that are at work in a really formative ecosystem. And there are things like uh, rituals and liturgies and psychological safety and joy. Like is, if the presence, if there is, if there is joy in the house, even you, know, you can think about this in a church context, usually that's a sign that something is right. And that's not the only thing, but there, so it's sort of like, I came up with these principles of like, there were many of them, 16 of character formation. Like if you as a donor, if you as an institutional leader can answer these questions, does your organization have a strong sense of T loss, what it is for a transcendent mission, if all these things are kind of in place then you can bet that either the organization you're thinking about supporting philanthropically or that you're leading and that you're responsible for stewarding the culture. It was like a cultural audit for like healthy formative institutions. And I, that became this very fun tool that really didn't feel like I came up with it. It was more like I was just inductively, you know, I first journalistically went around told, tried to paint a portrait of the most compelling communities that seemed to be saving lives and saving kind of moral trajectories. Um, and then I found like a pattern across sector of what was actually going on in a really healthy collective um, and, na and the power of sort of naming those first order principles um, just be has become and it continues to be, I think, a toolkit for a variety of organizations who I, there was even interest. Actually, I don't think this unfortunately went anywhere, but there was interest from some Congress people, U.S. Congress. They were like, we would love to start a character caucus, like based on these 16 questions or these 16 principles. Like, what would it how could we think of Congress as actually forming its members and not just being a platform? So it kind of it was. I, I'm so grateful for that project. Um, and just, it was also fun, frankly, to see the, the way in which the naming of reality and storytelling and invitational questions animated by, I think, timeless principles of human flourishing and the true and the good um, could also animate a community and even a coalition of, in, in that case, sort of donors, doers, and thinkers together to kind of not necessarily build a movement, although that would be cool. I don't think I was the person to drive that, but to at least catalyze um, a united group of people. And so that words were not just to stay on the page, like the naming of reality, in this case, story and principles um, can actually galvanize like movement in the world. And I, it, for me to experience that was very delicious and to sort of convene and design events around the material and so that was that. And then I'll end here because I'm tired of talking about myself. <laughs> um, I Comet Magazine, which had originally actually given me one of my first um, public writing opportunities before I moved to Houston. I think they had asked me to talk about like the relationship of politics and love, which I remember thinking was such a weird that was like, those two things do not go together. This is apples <laughs> and oranges. But I did my best to like do the splits between these two logics. And I uh, started writing for them a bit and just always appreciated this particular magazine's way of 
integrating my actual faith into large cultural questions, which was sort of felt like going back to Wheaton in some ways um, and just testing the bounds of head and heart and what are our convictions and what do we know, how do what say what we're learning about social isolation or distrust or polarization or whatever impact the way we actually lead our lives. And I think that sort of distinctly Christian earnestness around, yes, we can analyze trends from afar, but ultimately we are embodied creatures. Like we also need to figure out our response in our own lives. If we have some of, if there's some relevance to our vocation and how we steward that vocation. So comma had been a place for me to explore some of this in public and writing and they believe in institutions. They believe in formation. They love civil society. Um, their tagline is public theology for the common good. And so I think this work that I had done around institutions and formation and character um, just really was totally singing to their choir. So they reached out and said, you know, we have an opening for a new editor in chief. And um, so that was its own discernment process. And I've been doing it now uh, right since right before COVID. So 2019. And it's been like the joy of my, like the joy of my um, adult life to be stewarding this magazine in this season of North American life and try to figure out, you know, we're, we are primarily a cultural magazine, but that doesn't mean we're apolitical. I've sometimes maybe shy away from political controversy, but, you know, trying to figure out how do we tap into and catalyze conversations around small dinner tables often for what you say, the audiences of your podcast, these like those in holy discontent who are often, our audience tends to be those kind of typically local, though there are some national figures, um, but typically kind of local community shepherds, they could have an institutional leadership role or just be like a beloved, trusted neighbor in a neighborhood um, who are increasingly beleaguered and challenged and don't feel like they're getting the vocabulary or tools to sort of sew into hopeful, constructive, common ground building work on the ground um, in their communities. And we're trying to provide succor and imagination and unlikely exemplars and even companions for the journey through the pages of a magazine. Um, and I love, I love, you know, and that doesn't mean we avoid critique. Like we do have pieces that we're, we are quite critical and, you know, but we're trying to say, we do believe like 2000 years of Christian social thought can animate how we, you know, try to exist in this fragile democracy. Um, how we think about treating all people as infinitely dignified, um, how we, you know, increasingly I'm getting pulled into, you know, okay, well, what do, what do you as a magazine think about all these trends and quote Christian nationalism, you know, so the, these political currents are happening and our, I feel like my job increasingly is like, okay, we need to be, we want to stay um, orthodox and address like the deeply pre-political human questions first, but there are still implications if you're starting to see certain trends across on both far left and right that are fundamentally like dehumanizing and I would argue heretical <laughs> as a, you know, how do, how do we sort of um, define our turf? It's, it's, I, I'll, I'll just close by saying, I think people probably know me as being like aggressively committed to hope and not being overly a grouser or overly like focus on all the negative. Um, and I think my question these days and even trying to understand this historically is like, insofar as we're in a moment where it feels like movements, are largely fueled by fear and um, you could argue hate or just let's just say fear, sort of fear-based fuel, um, which I think is a function of politics sweeping into seeping into every part of life because like the political, the political juice is often fear. It works really well. Um, is it also possible simultaneously for hope to fuel a movement or hope to fuel like a multi-tier community of people animated by um, philosophy grounded in self-sacrificing love. And, um, yeah, I hope it's possible. I, I think historically you, you do tend to see these two movements happening simultaneously. Um, but it remains to, sometimes I think in the age of like what gets clicks and, you know, where are people really galvanized when they're outraged? You know, you see like when, if you're just looking at like mass numbers and it's, it, there are moments you get discouraged and you're like, gosh, is, is being 
a publication that's trying to be constructive and imaginative and a reforming one, not so much a revolutionary one, is that is that just going to stay very boutique and small and it's not it's not going to really mushroom um, because people are so addicted to the outrage machine. Mm-hmm. So it's an open question. I genuinely don't know, but we're, we're betting on hope. We're sweet. We're just, just even for my own sanity, I just, I can't go too far the other direction. So you, you know, that was you, a very long winded, I, oh, I'm sorry no, I went it, so long, but you gave me so much space. So I just no, thought, well, I'll give you the meandering wanted, river of my life. <laughs> I wanted you to be able to hit freely. Um, and you Thank did, you. You, you, you touched on so many different things that actually we've talked about a lot whether it's the formation, the understanding of institutions, the politicization of our culture. We've actually looked a lot at neuroscience and neurotheology as a subject in, in understanding spiritual formation and how our brains are actually wired um, for joy. You mentioned joy, and that that has become kind of a hallmark of what we've been talking about because our brains are actually wired for it. And you 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 moved into belonging. And one of the things that we've noticed is even within the church, um, and, and speaking with some neurotheologians that we've had on the show frequently, is that our brains are actually wired for joy. And the first part of joy comes from seeing like our mother's face in the crib that they're delighted to see us and our brain lights up. But he said, our brains are actually wired to determine then reading faces from the time we're quite young, if a person enjoys being with us or not. And that joy is where it comes from, is someone wanting to be with us. And unfortunately, within the faith communities, that's not been the case oftentimes. And I think, as you said, we're, we are addicted to outrage. We're addicted to outrage. We've we've learned how to manipulate the emotion to get the clicks. I personally think, though, that you can only do that so long. Um, maybe I'm underestimating the power of fear, but I think that there is an adrenaline fatigue but yeah, I do fatigue, weariness, exhaustion. Yep, I agree. It, it, it's and just, I think we've even seen that train play out since, say, like the summer of 2020. Like I somehow, yeah. even even just hearing what people are saying about their New Year's resolutions this January 2023, uh, it's been interesting. I'm just like attending to some, like, what is the zeitgeist here? And um, I mean, there's a lot of things like slow focus. I want to be able to savor more full attentiveness. So there's that, which is really important and crucial in our time, but um, different communities that it's been, it just, it, because different communities have different reasons for outrage and mm-hmm. right. exhaustion uh, as you would know well but from many experiences, but especially yeah. that Aurora church you mentioned. Um, and I, I'm sensing a lot of like quiet, hidden, constructive reimagining work happening in a lot of different communities as they're just tired of like the Instagram performativity and the sort of uh, constant public condemnation. Like even if that's still happening out there, I'm sensing a lot of people just withdraw to more productive work. My only question Mm -hmm. mark is, are we getting back into certain kinds of silos and, you know, Mm -hmm. so that's, that's kind of a, it's just a question mark I have. I don't, I don't fully know. Um, But I do sense there's a response there. We've hit the sort of exhaustion peak. Yeah, I I, I agree, but I, I love what you you're doing. One of the things that we talk about is the Semper Reformanda. We're always reforming. We're always rethinking. And we, one of our core values is exploring history. Um, when Oz Guinness was on the show, of course, he's like, you know, we don't know history anymore. We don't see the the cycles, the, the, the pendulum swings back and forth. But our time seems different in that everything is so public of, of what we're doing. And that's why you, it seems that you've hit on the theme of embodiment. Um, what, why has comment... I mean, why has embodiment and rediscovery of personhood become so important? You've written about that in in comment. Um, why has it become so important today? Yeah, I mean, so many reasons. Um, I think every, this is all in our mind, even as like the latest news about all these chat bots is like on every newspaper yeah. front page yeah. Yeah. as like, you know, and I'm reading all these higher ed administrators and pedagogical designers are like, oh my goodness, we have to totally change the way we teach. And I mean, my first response to the whole chat bot thing, and this is me being naive, and I actually do need to read a lot more so because we need to engage on this seriously, but as a magazine, but I was like, I feel like this is just an opportunity to like really double down on 
the sliver, but maybe the big sliver of what human beings will only ever be ever be able to do. And and that has impact that has implications for how we think about the, you know, slowly dying liberal arts. Like, shouldn't this be the moment for the liberal arts to like come back with a vengeance? You know, there's some so so I do think just technologically, just as one angle on this, there's um there is somehow, and I think COVID for all of its bad, for all of its sort of tumult, and of course, um, horrific ways in which it unequally struck so many families and communities, just mortality, death, et cetera. There, there was, if there was one thing I noticed, I kind of ran this project called Breaking Ground Over COVID where, um, I was trying to just like ask a wide array of people, what is this time revealing about our society, about ourselves? What can we learn from history? And like the common thing I think I got out of that project was people are attending and trying to name what is most human about us. And I do think embodiment and limits and our relational like finitude and our sort of relational wiring Um were the major takeaways for many, many, many people. Um, uh, I could name more attributes, but so, so I think um, not to get meta, we write about this, like partly, I, partly I think, um, I mean, there's many reasons why we've written so much about the human being and personhood um, and embodiment. I think one is as a publication that is rooted in what we call these like 2000 years of Christian social thought, and that mm -hmm. can be kind of drawn into questions around what is the future of the church and what it, um, somehow it feels like a lot of religion. And maybe this has been, a, you know, this is maybe a true as ever since Jesus's time, but mm -hmm. it feels like a lot of religious talk and focus sometimes like acts, winds up being a distraction away from the needs and beauty and glory of the human person. Like there's sort of, I can't, I can't explain. I need to get clear on this in my own head, but sometimes it feels like a lot of theological talk and a lot of like hemming and hawing about the church falls accidentally into this like logic of empire or around numbers or sort of American metrics of like, there's so many sort of conversations happening yeah. that seem to be ignoring. Um, the, well, the tangible the, realities on being human. Yes, exactly. Right. That we're embodied, you know, I think in the fullest embodied human history. of all time, namely Christ himself. Right. Yeah. 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 So I, um, yeah, I just think this is an, there is an opening right now as so many people, as everyone at different levels of consciousness are confronted with ways in which, you know, um, are sort of are confronted with forces that seem to be making us feel less, that making us feel more disintegrated, mm -hmm. um, less connected to others, um, totally unseen, um, you know, all the ways in which I think we just, we feel increasingly like, tempted are we just becoming robots are we becoming machines um this is an opportunity for those animated by i think a christian sort of understanding of the human person to speak and to speak constructively on a range of concrete issues whether it's end of life and death whether it's how we understand what the person is from cradle to grave what i mean there's many areas that even touch into policy to answer your question, which is more how I wanted to answer it right away about embodiment and like our work, um, I think I just uh, this is even it, it it tags back to my wanting to leave more elite media circles and like get into the texture of real human lives and in some ways leave like the realm of philosophy and into real communities, real human lives. That's partly dispositional. I naturally learn from practitioners and people who are just figuring out creative ways to love and to. Um, cover the gap, cover sort of the gaps where the vulnerable are falling through. I've always been drawn to the like nitty gritty practicalities of that in context um, and more than like an intellectual seminar. And yet there's something insofar as we're trying to spark new imagination for a more thriving society. I just don't think, especially in an age deluge with content, um, I just don't think you can be soft before an argument or an imaginative piece or even a story, unless you are kind of 
talking about it or at least experiencing it relationally and ideally around like in a hospitable setting with tables and food. So, so I've tried to build into the magazine itself. Like here we are a little bit, you said, you know, high middle brow intellectually, we like pitch at a certain level. Um, but that ideally these big questions around what does it mean to be human and what does that, how is that threatened? And also what are the new opportunities in our day? How do we talk about that in our context, in our particular vocational roles with accountability in relationship and allow conversations to get deeper that, that enable, that sort of create the conditions for tears when necessary, for great laughter, for an aha moment about oneself or about one's neighborhood or about one's workplace. Um, where in some ways it's just like trying to be the church, <laughs> but yeah, no, I just yeah. don't, I, I just don't think I just have come to the conviction that especially in our day, things like persuasion, conversion, transformation, communion, all those beautiful things and experiences don't just, I mean, unless you are a gorgeous writer and who is extremely skilled and you're writing a novel, they just usually don't happen by yourself reading words on a page or even beautiful images. They somehow have to be shared and broken open with others. So that's just kind of my conviction. And um, yeah, there's, I don't, I'm not the neuroscience expert, but I have a funny feeling there's some brain science to back this up. <laughs> you can no, no, tell no, no. me. To me, it all congeals. This, this is where all this comes together. And this is what I love about it. Really what you've just, to me is described is what the purpose of the church kind of is. Um, and, and I know you're in a public arena, so it's a little bit different, but my, my world has been the church for over 20 years and having, you know, grown up in it too. So it's long, much longer than that, but this, this idea of embodiment, the transformation aspect, even, um, and I know we, I think we've both talked to the same person, Kelly Capic, where he gets yes. into, you. Oh, um, I love he, Kelly's work and oh, yeah, he's fantastic. And he's well, so fun to talk to. Yeah. We had a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun on the show because he was he was a guest on the show, but also Alan Noble um, mm. he wrote a book called um, You Are Not Your Own. own. Yeah, because mm -hmm. Alan was on yeah. the show. And then we have. Um, Gosh, I'm so honored. Really? What am I doing on here? And these are oh, like no, you're luminaries. The best one. You're the best <laughs> one so far. You are the best one. <laughs> Uh, but you're rambler you're rambling guest <laughs> you know uh, christopher watkin is coming on um who just wrote the most okay. recent book um i don't know if you can see that biblical critical theory and it's on higher Christian oh yes theory. i've been i've been uh, a lot of people are talking about this yeah it, i'm uh it's on it's on my it's coming it's coming my way i think it's in my amazon queue <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're we're trying to find these tangible ways because it was my contention that modernity has really shaped us in, as Noble says, in human ways. You know, we're humans have created yes. inhuman institutions and practices, and it's it's funny to me that even when you look, and I, I try to analyze this, it sounds so silly, but looking at Jesus movies, this is going to mm -hmm. sound weird, but in the beginning, the Jesus movies really focused on the deity of Jesus, yes. but mm -hmm. as they've transitioned. It, it's because we, we we were so in touch with our hum humanity, we needed the deity. But with the rise of technology mm -hmm. and the, the 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 pseudo omnis, meaning that we're really not omniscient, but it feels like we can know everything. We really are not omnipresent, but we feel like we can be present with the social media and technology. We've lost touch touch with our humanity. So yes. you see, even in like the chosen, Jesus the chosen. is becoming more mm -hmm. human. Um, yes. he's, he's and laughter. their disciples are superhuman, which is how Huge. I hope they were. It's been encouraging to know what really was um, uh, not John. Um, oh, what's the Matt Peter? I was like, was Peter really such a badass? Like, <laughs> I guess that's kind of encouraging. Like, we don't have to be all squeaky clean. <laughs> or we watching the we were watching the video where he gets alone with his wife. <laughs> and yeah, seen each other for a while. And I was like. Oh, I mean, I'm watching with my kids. I know, know I know. But I'm like, this okay, is the most real episode I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. But even yeah. bringing Matthew being autistic. And mm -hmm. when he sends off James and uh, Simon the Zealot, you know, were you? No. Yeah. Yeah. The tax collector, Matthew, he sends off Matthew and Simon the Zealot, one who is trying who's an anarchist and one who was working for the government you know what i mean and, and he brings these two together talk about political differences but it seems that you guys have really tried to create and capture and, and i love what you said give language give language to us who are are working in the world and you're in a sphere that many of us have not familiar with and we're and i know we're not going to get to it today because we're, we're we're out of time i know that you have time that you have to keep 
So we have to do this again because we're I just getting warmed to. up. We're just getting warmed up. We're I know I feel the up. same way. I'm like, now we need to have a whole conversation about Christian humanism. And is that a phrase that will even work in a, after a generations of people thinking the word humanism is like horrible, but we need to have a long, much, yes, because this much is where I'm like spending a lot of my strategic and intellectual and just like, frankly, discerning time these days. Cause I, I think there's like, um, I don't know. I don't want to necessarily say like the Holy spirit, but I do think there is a something going on in this. There is a bridge moment. And I experienced mm-hmm. this even during the character project. Like I have a podcast called the whole person revolution, which is sort of what I wished I had been able to call this fabric of character book. Um, but there is something, there is like this humanistic Renaissance happening in different quarters of our society and I, I just think this is like the open door for Christians to like really meditate on the humanity of Christ. Of course, not at the at all at the expense of his divinity. And but there, but there's something going on, even as we think about how Christianity is being used as a sponsor of certain cultural projects that are lifting up only certain kinds of humans as like the ideal human and not. I mean, there's just like many implications for how we think more deeply about the human person and Christianity's relation to that question over centuries throughout the world that I just find extremely important and timely Mm -hmm. and rich territory, but we need to do it in a way that like applies to the person running a healthcare center in Des Moines, you know? So like I need to, and that's, that's like the bridging, there's multiple bridging challenges, but we need, I would love to have a sequel conversation. About we are. This. We're going to have a sequel conversation because you're you're even opening up again. I'm like, no, we can't start another conversation right now. Sorry. It's so because I mean, I'm I'm I yeah, we'll geek out all day. Um, OK, but but right before we finish up here, tell us how people can learn more about you and what you're doing. Well, I would love for people to check out comment.org, which is really, um, I mean, that is what I'm stewarding. Uh, It's not really me. I just feel like I'm this quiet conductor of voices, much smarter and more interesting than me, but it's where we, um, we have a couple of podcasts, one called whole person revolution that sort of interviews more practitioners of some of the ideals we lift up in our pages. Another podcast called zealots at the gate, which is an interesting conversation around religion and democracy between a Muslim and an evangelical. we're just doing a lot of different things, experimenting with hospitality and ideas. And we're really right now trying to, um, what we're trying to ask and experiment in real time. What does it look like to, to mature a magazine into a real time community in the flesh in communities all over the U S uh, and Canada. So if you're interested in that, go to comment.org, see we're piloting a lot of new things that are kind of stretching us outside of the pure publication space. And we need help and we need encouragement and um, we need champions of people who will kind of be willing to experiment with this. So comment.org, that's the best I can say. Well, thank you, Anne, for coming thank on. Thank you. Apollo's it's been really a joy.